For Criminal Media's Quality, this is Sane Lamini. Joining me today is Director of the Catholic Parliamentary Liaison Office of the Southern African Bishops, Peter John Pearson, to discuss his paper on ANC Policy Conference and Migrants. So it was always expected that uh, the ruling African National Congress Policy Conference will discuss, amongst other issues, the step-aside resolution and uh, nationalization of the Reserve Bank and issues uh, related to immigrants. But to what extent is the step-aside resolution dividing the party as provinces such as Limpombo and KZN are against it? Look, I think that... Um those who are threatened by it um, and those who have a particular view on um, political um, uh, jobs after um, the next um, uh, um, uh, conference um, would be pushing to um, to get it uh, either watered down completely or uh, thrown off the agenda. I think we've emerged from that policy conference with a, with a more um, coherent and a stronger position on that. Um, I think at the moment it is not such a um, divisive issue. There are many who would obviously want it um, uh, removed, but I think there is a consolidation around it now. We need to accept that there's a consolidation. The Home Affairs Minister, Dr. Aaron Motualedi, has been praised uh, for what he has done in extending the validity of Zimbabwean exemption permits. Is South Africa on the right path uh, to solve the immigration issue? I think with regard to the um, Zimbabwean exemption permits, and this is going to come up again because he's given um, an indication that the Lesotho um, permits are also going to be stopped at the end of 2023 when when they fall due. I think we are not really on the right um, um, uh, direction with regard to the Zimbabwean exemption permits. The holders of these permits have been here in the country for um, at least 11 years. 12 years, but many of them longer, because recall that it was only those who were here at the first issuance of the exemption permit that qualified to um, to to have it renewed over the years. New people couldn't join um, and receive permits after that uh, 2009 date. These people have been here, um, most of them before that date, but certainly all of them um, since that day. Um, and secondly, um, not only have they made homes and have contributed to the to the country and to the fiscus, um, it's not unusual in many, many countries of the world that by the time people are here for such a long time that they become eligible for permanent residence. And so my feeling is that given that we are only talking about 178,000, which in the scheme of things is not a big number in a population of 60.6 million people, mm -hmm. given that they've been here so long, that they are stable components of the society, I think we should be moving towards offering them permanent residence rather than withdrawing um, the permit and expecting them to repatriate to a country that many of them last lived in a long time ago, and some of them indeed um, have never lived in, and which, according to many um, uh, surveys and studies, has not achieved the economic or political stability that first occasioned the granting of those ZDP. So I think for that group, we are not going in the right direction. We ought to be accommodating them, continuing their residence here. And those who are here undocumented and those who are in a different position, that's another discussion that I think we need to apply our minds to. But with regard to 
the ZDP holders, I do believe that we should be moving in the direction of stabilizing it. We've had all sorts of stories about contracts for work that have not been renewed because um, the um, the employers are saying, well, we don't think you'll be here after next year. Um, all sorts of people who've had trouble with uh, financial institutions. And so I think it's leading to a lot more upheaval than it's worth. So my uh, point is that for people who've been here so long, stably, um, let's offer them uh, what they have a right, I think, to expect after so many years. Do you think the issue of immigration poses any threat uh, to national security? I think that we have become so used to um, viewing the issue of immigration through the lens of security. I think this has become an international phenomenon. You hear it in um, in Europe, you hear it in the United States, you hear it in um, Australasia, you hear it everywhere. This is a security um, issue. I mean, I come from a school that would rather see it as a humanitarian issue. Mm -hmm. And I worry extensively about casting it only in a security, uh, through a security lens. I think mm -hmm. I'm worried that when things become security issues, it offers people in power um, the opportunity to use security as a reason or an excuse for tampering with human rights, for um, introducing legislation that, uh, that, that also reduces human rights. So things like, um, you know, extra detection, extra vigilance, crossing over uh, boundaries uh, to exercise, um, you know, uh, uh, in introspection and in people's lives. All of these things can happen when it's a security issue and for security, we can um, withdraw some of the parameters of human rights security that people have. And of course, I stand to be corrected here, yeah. but I'm not sure, and I've read this, that we've, I mean, I've read in this area considerably that there is a standard um, uh, uh, movement of terrorists and people who harm the security of nations through the flow of immigrants. I'm not sure that that has been um, that that has been proven. Um, so I'm worried that the, that human rights can be limited when security becomes the reason that all sorts of um, rights can be suspended. I'm worried that we are working on assumptions that have not been fully tested. And I think that if exceptions to this are shown, then those are the areas that we need to plug, not in a way punish everybody by hectic mm. through hectic security measures from um you know what should be a humanitarian accommodation now let us talk about what is also widely debated in the country that uh, the immigrants also put a strain on the health system why which side of the debates do you fall on when, when it comes to that i saluted what um um the minister of health uh, said recently where he said that, and he pointed out what we all know, and that is that the um, the uh, constitution uh, provides uh, for certain emergency help for people irrespective of status. There is a category of help that can be and should be given to anybody uh, without financial contribution, um, irrespective of status. We know, for instance, that vaccination for children under six years old, um, childbirth for a, a pregnant woman, um, and a number of um, 
of issues are um, are available to everybody. And he, but he made the point that not only do we need to be constitutionally compliant, but mm. he made the point that even if it were not for the pressure put on the system by what he um, called our neighbors, the health system would still be dysfunctional. It would still be um, problematic because there are huge other areas that um, contribute to that dysfunction. Maladministration, he pointed out. He pointed out corruption. He made a point of saying that the um, in, uh, investigative unit has been given, I think, uh, seven or, uh, or, or uh, quite a big number of official instructions signed up by the president to investigate corruption in the healthcare system. Um, there's a shortage of personnel. There's um, shrinking budget. There are big, weighty areas um, that need to be considered uh, way beyond um, only looking at the um, at the at the at the neighbors or the um, foreign nationals or migrants. I think the other point um, that needs to be made in all of this is that if we start blaming foreign nationals or migrants for all our dysfunctions, for all our pathologies in South Africa, and that's a tendency that's growing, you know, whether it be drugs, whether it be crime, whether it be the healthcare system, there are voices in our society that put the blame solely and only at the door of migrants. Mm -hmm. um, that means that we are only looking possibly at one sliver of the problem and hoping that fixing that problem will fix the whole system, whereas, in fact, the dysfunctions are rooted in many areas, as I say, corruption, maladministration, and so forth. So it takes, it deflects the attention from those critical areas and tries to lay it at one door and hope that fixing that one area will fix the whole system. And that's, uh, you know, that's, that's just not realistic. On the issue of unemployment, you say that a uh, government's inability to create new jobs cannot be blamed on the presence of the foreign nationals. You say there are better ways to, to address the issue rather than opting to exclude them. Tell us about that. I think that it's um, very clear that South, the South African government rightly has a duty to... Um, the vast number of unemployed. I mean, the numbers are just mushrooming. Um, there's a special concern that I think we all share that youth unemployment is burgeoning and we don't seem to have a grip on that. But I think, again, there must be a multi-pronged assessment of how we work that, exploring full areas where where we can employ people, but again, are just looking at this area that I don't think, given the numbers, is the largest and the biggest problem uh, um, in unleashing um, more job opportunities for, uh, for people. And also in your paper, it was interesting that you are also reminding us that we cannot blame uh, our neighbors for what is happening in our country because we've being uh, under a hostile apartheid regime. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, we, um, we and I quote in the paper um, words that Nelson Mandela spoke in Alexandria Township around, mm -hmm. um, you know, not putting the blame on other people, but looking into ourselves and fixing the areas that are dysfunctional ourselves. So I think we need to take a more circumspect view of um, of how we, we tackle all the problems and not lay everything there. I mean, apartheid has left us with a legacy of deprivation that it's going to take a very long time to kind of put right justly. And we need in that time to embrace all the skills that we can find. 
Um, and I think one of the things that we need to remember when it comes to jobs and when it comes to social cohesion, because the point I was making about apartheid was apartheid ripped any uh, destroyed any possibility of social cohesion, and we need to rebuild that. But we can only rebuild it by an inclusivity that has room for everybody who can make a contribution. That was the point I was pursuing in that mm -hmm. argument. But I think just on the issue of jobs, which we spoke about a minute ago, I mean, one of the things that is not factored into, um, into these discussions is the fact that so many of the people who are here from neighboring countries, for instance, are here and provide opportunities for South Africans to have jobs. There's a lot of research that has been done on that. And I think we mustn't overlook that part of the a resolution of the unemployment process, a small part, but a part anyway, um, mm. is also through the entrepreneurship of, um, of foreign nationals in our country. That was director of the Catholic Parliamentary Liaison Office of the South African Bishops, Peter John Pearson, speaking to Polity about his paper on ANC Policy Conference and Migrants.